Welcome um, to everybody for joining us today at this DFI webinar where we're going to talk a bit more about ADHA. And I was really excited for this webinar because I actually read this report um, uh, early this year and I really, really wanted to reach out and, and have a webinar and I just didn't have the contacts. But thankfully, um, due to friends of ours, we managed to connect through to our speakers today, to Petra and Priti, um, and they both agreed to speak with us. So I'm really excited that this webinar that I dreamt of earlier in the year is actually happening for real. As many of you know, um, who are our DFI alumni, um, ADHA features heavily in many of our courses, such as Leading Digital Money Markets, uh, Certificate in Digital Money, and our Digital Identity course. However, our information is possibly from a couple of years ago. So I'm really excited to both A, update our knowledge, but B, also look at it from a user perspective. So not just from the perspective of people like ourselves, who want to leverage digital identity to help increase uptake of digital finance. Some of the issues are, and, and successes and some potential challenges there are from, um, from the ordinary citizen who want to use digital identity. Just a quick reminder to everybody, we are recording today's session um, so that we can share it with those who missed out. And if you really enjoy the session, please do feel free to send a link, which I'll be sending you all tomorrow um, to your colleagues so they can catch up on what they missed. Um, and also just a reminder as well, um, if you wish to ask any of our panelists any questions today, you can put them in the Q&A function so that we can get round to reading them out and answering them towards the end of the session. So without further ado, um, rather than going on about me and uh, what I'm excited about, I want to hand over to our wonderful panelists who are going to tell us a little bit more about their report, their experiences and share some of the key learnings. So over um, to you, uh, Petra and Priti. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Preeti. I'm a senior advisor at Dalberg. I'm really, really delighted to meet you all, along with my colleague, uh, Petra, who really is going to be the main sort of uh, star of the show today. I'm just going to do a quick introduction. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Dalberg, uh, Dalberg is an impact advisory firm uh, based out of 23 locations around the world. And uh, primarily, we work on research and strategy issues specifically in the impact space, all the way from financial inclusion to digital identity to uh, data privacy, climate change, and so on. So really excited to be chatting with all of you today and uh, really keen to also hear from you some of the thoughts and questions you might have at the end of the session. And uh, Petra, maybe you could start sharing the screen uh, so I could just do a quick sort of intro. So we sort of uh, wrapped up this study late last year. Uh, and uh, sorry, Petra, are you able to share your screen? Coming up. Oh, awesome, excellent, excellent. And could we do, oh yeah, perfect. So, so yeah, as you can see, it was called State of Aadhaar, uh, you know, people's perspective. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Aadhaar. Uh, can you sort of maybe quickly raise hands or put it in the chat? Uh, but for those of you who are not sort of very familiar with Aadhaar, it's one of the world's largest digital identity systems, uh, you know, with over a billion people in India alone who are signed up to it, and specifically residents. So it's not a proof of citizenship, but it's really for residents in India, whether they are of Indian origin or not. And uh, it was started almost 10 years ago as, as one of the largest uh, experiments and you know as you can see it's the initiative was anchored by Dalberg and really really led by Petra and a couple of other colleagues of mine who couldn't join us today Shweta and Gaurav and was supported by Omidyar Network India who are one of the largest social venture uh, you know, sort of investors as well as uh, philanthropists. Can we go to the next slide Petra? And you know so a little bit more about what is Aadhaar so really, you know, it is a, a system of identification based on people's demographic as well as bi biometric data. So you can really authenticate using your fingerprint. And, uh, you know, as I said, it's for residents and it's a unique sort of 12 digit number. Now the enrollment is voluntary, but you know, in India, of course, for a lot of, uh, to getting government benefits and, uh, you know, also private services, in many instances, it is almost mandatory to have an author. 
So in effect, while it's voluntary, uh, many people have had to sign up for it, you know, to get, uh, you know, government benefits as well as services. So it's also, uh, can we move to the next one? It's also a really hot topic, you know, and then people are incredibly, have polarized views on Aadhaar from, uh, you know, hailing it as one of the world's largest sort of experiments on digital ID, which has sort of opened up, you know, the world of public and private services to many citizens, given identity for many people for the first time. Uh, to also, you know, especially a lot of civil society members concerned about, you know, its potential for, you know, harming data privacy, potentially sort of being used as a surveillance tool and so on. So it's really, uh, you know, very, very polarized and, and a hot topic. And, um, you know, we sort of started, you can, you can have the full slide, Petra. And we sort of, uh, you know, really, and actually Omidya rather, our, our funders, you know, started the State of Aadhaar Initiative in 2016, uh, you know, and uh, sort of uh, was anchored by ID Insight for the first couple of years and then by Dalberg. And really the main aim of the initiative was to provide sort of data back discussions to this topic on Aadhaar. Like, you know, is it actually working on the ground? Who is it working for? Uh, who's getting left out? How are people using it? You know, so really, really bringing data to the conversation rather than just opinions uh, of, of folks. And, you know, moving on to the next slide. So, so what we really did was, uh, you know, looked at the experience of the ordinary resident of India. You know, the, the study really looked at the entire journey of the user uh, from enrolling, what is the enrollment experience to get this ID to, you know, if there are errors in the ID, you know, what is the updating experience to linking it to use a particular service to using the service and the moment of authentication, because primarily what Aadhaar is, is a tool to verify whether you are indeed the person you claim to be. So it's really nothing more than that technically. Uh, however, of course, it's much more than that. And service delivery, and I know many of you are interested in, you know, how sort of digital identity could be used for financial services, and Petra will talk more about it in a bit. But, uh, you know, what is that experience of actually linking your author to a service and being able to use it? And then the summative experience, you know, of the residents in terms of do they trust the system? You know, how satisfied are they overall? And sort of, you know, how, what, what are the core benefits of this ID as well as the core challenges? So our methodology really looked at, I mean, we surveyed over 167,000 people across India uh, using, you know, a couple of different methods from sort of in-depth uh, quantitative survey, uh, you know, spanning from 45 minutes to also, you know, a quick one for 10 to 15 minutes to just get a pulse of some of the key questions. And then also an in-depth sort of human-centered design research approach where we sort of went into the participants' homes and had in-depth conversations with them, you know, really using different tools to understand how they sort of use the system. So it was a, it was a mixed methodology, which uh, sort of gave us rather rich results, which I will now hand over really Petra to sort of uh, go over and share with you. So first, I'd like to run you through very quickly of how important within 10 years Atar has become. So about 1.2 billion people have it at this point throughout India, and they use it for food to access their, rash, their food rations. Um, they use it for energy in the sense that they, um, th that they provide it to get their LPG subsidies for livelihoods, for employment guarantee schemes, for subsidies for farmers, for social pensions. Um, they use it for finance. At this point, about 72% of people have linked their bank accounts to Atar, and a total of 87% of bank accounts are linked. Actually, since these are no numbers are from last year, by now it's probably even higher. Um, and you have millions and millions of transactions that are completed by the Atar enabled payment system. So Adar is also a financial address, not just an, can be used as a financial address, not just as an ID. 
Um, it's used for school enrollment, but almost half of children have used it. And it's used for communications in the sense that um, many people use it to get a SIM card. So it's deeply embedded in people's lives. Um, so it's all the more important, of course, that it, that it works and it works well and for everyone. Um, I'm going to run you through uh, this user journey that Preeti just described for you, starting with um, getting and updating ATAR. So at this point, 90% of people have ATAR, and um, that's also true across almost all states. There, there's been slightly slower rollout in a couple of states, as you can see in those light blue areas in the Northeast, but otherwise um, it's widely, widely adopted. Sorry, my mouse. It also goes beyond being just a functional ID. For some people, it's, it's really, there's also an emotional attachment. We met a trans woman who told us that, you know, with an ATAR card, I will be able to say I'm also a human being. It will give me the freedom and uh, the police will no longer be able to harass me. One of the features of ATAR is that um, third gender is a possibility that you can uh, tick on your ATAR card. So this gives, gives a sense of empowerment to people who would otherwise not have been seen themselves reflected on their ID. That said, a lot of people still don't have ATAR. So we estimate that um, as of last year to have been about 102 million. A lot of these are children who technically don't um, have to have ATAR, but more and more, as Preeti mentioned, needed to access government services or in some cases to enroll in school. Then you have the Northeastern states where there's also um, fairly low adoption. And then you have still a remaining approximately 7 million people who don't have ATAR yet. And there are a few interesting things to note about them. One is that there are communities that are disproportionately left out. So homeless families or third gender residents. And contrary to what was a popular conceit at the time we started this study, um, pretty much everyone who doesn't have an ATAR wants it. Here we have a quote from um, Mahadevi, a basket weaver who's homeless, who has not been able to get ATAR because she can't prove her address. Once people have ATAR, updating becomes an important issue. This is important because we found that about 10% of people had an error on their ATAR when they first received it. And about 12% of people have had a change in their life that affects the information on ATAR. They changed their name after marriage, they changed address, um, they updated, they got a new mobile number. Um, unfortunately, uh, updating ATAR is incredibly hard and about one in five pe people who tried to update didn't succeed. For the rest, um, we have about 4% of people who currently report at least one error on their ATAR card. And this is mostly in their date of birth, but also pretty much in every other field um, that's captured and that's printed on the card. In addition, there's information that's not printed on the ATAR card that you carry which would be your mobile phone number, for example. And um, using ATAR digitally really requires you to have the correct mobile phone number. And we found that only 39% actually had that. Um, some had errors, some hadn't linked a number, some weren't sure, but it's, um, that really impedes their ability to use many of the features of ATAR. And then um, obviously people cannot know whether their biometric information is correct or not. Nevertheless, um, somewhere between 0.5 and 1% uh, told us that their biometric information was incorrect, most likely because they tried to authenticate and face some sort of problem. So this is, again, just a quote to show you where some of the difficulties come from. Um, 
it's difficult to get to an update center. Update centers take a limited number of um, people and um, may or may not be able to solve the, the problem that was uh, existing on the card. This ends up costing people a lot of money. Um, and a lot of, as if one in five uh, people are unsuccessful, approximately one in five dollars was spent on unsuccessful updates. And we track this down, the 16 billion rupees translate to about uh, 200 million US dollars. Um, and most of that goes towards fees, where people are either paying inflated fees or paying the update fee multiple times until they succeed or give up. Um, but documents and travel are also important. And then some people uh, try to work with agents or think that's their only option their only option. In, in general, updating is just quite difficult and can become expensive for people. Then assuming you have ATAR and it's correct, how do people use it? So on average, they use it about once a month. And the most common uses are for bank accounts, SIM cards, the LPG subsidy that I mentioned earlier, and the food ration program, which in India is called PDS. At one point, um, ATAR was actually mandatory for bank account, for opening a bank account. That has since been overturned but um, that may account, uh, partly account for the high usage of ATAR for opening bank accounts or for other financial instruments. Within these usages, ATAR has supported inclusion. So we asked people, you know, which ID was the first ever ID that you received? And um, for about 8% of adults, ATAR was the first one that they had. Um, of groups who, are who typically find it difficult to get ID, we had about almost twice the proportion. So for homeless and third gender populations, we had 15 and 14% who said ATAR was their first ever ID. These, um, these people then went on to access services for the first time as well. So now that they had ID, they could get access to bank accounts. So 50% of the people who had it as the first ID went on to open a bank account uh, to get a SIM card for the first time or to access food rations for the first time. And even for those who were getting these services before, um, many reported an improvement in service delivery. So for several of the government welfare programs, um, there was a large sense that these programs had become more reliable with ATAR. Um, getting a SIM card was seen to be faster and opening a bank account was seen to be easier. People used ATAR rather than another ID. And we, we spoke to Sona, who also said it just gets her, helps her get things done faster at the bank, be, even beyond just opening the bank account. On the flip side, unfortunately, ATAR can lead to exclusion from services. And we used a very narrow definition of exclusion, which means that you cannot even get on the rolls for the service. Um, and we estimate that 21 million people experienced exclusion from welfare services. So that's across food rations, MinRAKES is the employment guarantee scheme, and to a lesser extent, social pensions. And there's a, a fair number among them who used to receive the service, but now for an ATAR related reason can't get it anymore. And there are others who said that they're elig eligible for the service, um, but they can't get it because of ATAR. We also saw issues with private sector services. Um, about 3% of our uh, respondents said they couldn't get a bank account because of an ATAR related issue and nearly 1% uh, couldn't get a SIM card. 
then similarly as people um, saw changes in um, service reliability others saw um, transaction fr frictions or even denial of services that they were enrolled for and supposed to be getting one particularly concerning area was biometric authentication that failed uh, for people trying to ex access food rations. 5% um, of people experienced a failure and a third of them ended up not getting their rations at all. The employment guarantee scheme and social pensions also saw frictions, though at a slightly lower rate. And um, these transaction frictions go beyond the government welfare programs. Um, people experience all sorts of difficulties, denials, hardship, if their ATAR was wrong. Here in the case of Palanitra, factory worker, he couldn't get his uh, provident fund um, payments, which are kind of social security, and they, he's lost out on two months because of an error on his ATAR. Um, so a quick change of pace. One of the things we were really interested in was do people use Adar as a digital ID or as a just as a card, um, the, the printed card that you can just show with your photo on it. And we found that, um, you know, the card and the photocopy of a card are definitely the most common use cases, the most common way that people use Adar. But fingerprint authentication is something that almost half of people have used um, and then followed by lower usages of the ATAR just as a number, iris scan authentication, and there is um, also a feature with one-time passwords on your phone that hasn't been adopted much yet. Some newer features have been introduced recently, all of them digital, and these have seen uh, much lower adoption. If you look at the last three, masked ATAR, virtual ATAR number, and ATAR on your mobile, these all require um, online usage by the user as well, not just on the authentication side. And these have seen much, much lower adoption, and we suspect that might be in part because of the low um, accuracy of phone numbers or even the low adoption of linking phone number to your ID. Okay. Um, Preeti touched on this topic when she um, introduced us, which is that ATAR, enrollment in ATAR is voluntary. And there's been a Supreme Court ruling that um, clarifies this and says that for private sector services, ATAR cannot be mandatory, whereas for targeted uh, welfare uh, services, it can. However, um, we asked people who gave ATAR to access a service, why did you do that? Why did you give ATAR? And um, the vast majority of them just believed that ATAR is mandatory um, and that's mandated by the government. Then the, and many others found that their service provider only accepted ATAR. And then finally, there are some um, answers that we would consider more voluntary. You know, it's my only ID, so I give it, or it's convenient to give it. This is quite concerning, um, given the Supreme Court ruling saying that um, it's not supposed to be mandatory when their resident's experience is contrary to that. We also find, found that um, schools where the government, where the Supreme Court ruling equally said that um, ATAR cannot be mandatory or cannot prevent a child from going to school. Um, again, we found quite a high percentage of children who provide, had to provide ATAR for their school enrollment, either their own ATAR or their parents' ATAR, in some cases both. And a similar situation for midday meals. Here, the um, share was, was much smaller of the number of children who had to provide ATAR for midday meals, but we still did see it as um, fairly widespread. So given all these positives and negatives, the you know, 
service quality improvements, inclusion, exclusion, transaction frictions, how do people see the over, see ATAR overall? The vast majority is satisfied with ATAR. Um, the, even a majority is very satisfied and then another third somewhat satisfied. And that includes people who face difficulties. We broke it down to understand if people who would um, face denials and so on were less satisfied. Some of them were, but still the majority remained satisfied with ATAR. Even people who had faced an exclusion um, generally were still uh, had a positive sentiment. So what is it that they particularly appreciate or worry about? Um, the benefits that they perceive is most important. Everyone accepts it as identity proof, gives access to services. It's easy to carry one ID, just give fingerprints or an iris scan. Then when you look at the challenges, they're basically the flip side of the benefits. Um, too many services are linked. You can lose access to a service it's inconvenient to have to give it every time. And interestingly, a lot of people actually mention both. So they, they have a very nuanced view of ATAR. Um, overall, they're happy with it, but a very clear understanding of the challenges and difficulties that, that are there alongside the benefits. So in conclusion, it's provided significant benefits, but there's definitely still potential for improvements. Um, people experience, people use it a lot. They experience reliable and fast service. Um, some are getting services for the first time. But in, if you look at the opportunities for improvement, many want it or need it, but don't have it. In a country like India, a couple of percent who don't have it is still a huge number. And given that um, ATAR is becoming mandatory for many things, either uh, de jure or de facto, it's important for everyone to have access if they want it. Many transactions still fail. And so we need to figure out how to improve systems and how to um, make sure that the backup systems and the workarounds work. Many aren't given another option where it's de facto mandatory and um, technically they would have the option of providing a different ID, but in, their, in practice, that's not an option for them. And right now it's really hard to fix failures or errors, um, for example, in updating in, any errors on your ATAR. And I think one thing we've really seen is that the most vulnerable um, are the ones who, who really need care and access now. Um, there's an, definitely an unfinished agenda there for getting ATAR to, for example, homeless people or to their gender communities, where there's just an, definitely a strong need for the services that ATAR gives access to, and therefore it's especially important for them to be able to access and update ATAR. I'll leave you with one of our favorite quotes from our in-depth interviews. Atar is like a heart, it should keep working for as long as we are alive. With it, we can access all services, without it, none. I think this really sums up the, the sentiment that we saw throughout the research. I have given you a tiny, tiny, a glimpse of what the state of ATAR research has produced. Um, there is much, much, much more. And if you're interested in understanding more, in digging into this, I would really encourage you to dig in for yourself or to reach out to us to, to understand how to do that. We have a website where you can uh, play with indicators yourself and just get some, some top line numbers to understand differences by state or to dig a little bit deeper into some of the themes. And we also have um, uh, our data set freely available online for anyone who wants to go really, really deep. 
We're happy to take any questions and please do feel free to reach us out to reach out to us directly. I've left our email addresses at the bottom here, or you can reach out to the general email info at stateofadar.is. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, Preeti and I are really, really looking forward to the discussion and to what questions you might have um, so that we can jump into that. Wonderful, thank you very much for that um, great overview. Um, it's inspiring to hear that the vast majority are really positive um, about ADHA, which is good to hear. Um, but obviously, we know now that there's work to do. And yeah, I was, I was quite interested really to hear that it's the, the updates that seem to be causing quite a lot of barriers. So we do expect any ID system will generate mistakes in our ID, but the time it takes to correct that and time and effort it takes to correct that is quite challenging from, from what, you've, um, with what you've shared. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I'm going to go through some of the questions that have come in from the audience today. I'm going to start with um, Hui Lin's question, um, which kind of takes, takes back a little bit in history. So I guess we're trying to understand, you know, before Adha, what was the main, was there another, you know, option? Was there a way in which people did have ID? And, you know, why, was, why has Adha, I guess, become so important? Um, if you could maybe just tell us a little bit more about pre ad hoc times and, and its history. So there were, there was a wealth of different IDs available. I think there was just not an ID for everyone in that sense. So the, um, the ration card, which gives you access to the government's food ration program was a particularly popular one. Um, some people had caste certificates, voter IDs had a very high penetration. Um, we found that about, if I remember correctly, almost the same amount of people had a voter ID as had an Atar card. But again, that, that doesn't cover children, whereas children can get an Atar card. So there were lots and lots of different ones, but there wasn't really one for everyone. And they all... They were all for some purpose. And the idea of ATAR was, this is just to prove that you are who you say you are. Great, so it just, it, it kind of helped go for just having one, one thing that does everything as opposed to having to have multiple different cards or proof. Um, in that some way, that was one of the suggestions behind You this. still need the other cards for the functions that they're intended. So if you want to access your food rations, at this point, you still have to have a ration card, but your ADAR card covers the piece of proving that you say who you are if you want to get a ration card and you can use it to say who you are for a multitude of things. Okay, great. Thank you for that clarification. Um, and then we have a nice question come in. Um, for people who've not yet been able to get ADAR, due to things like lack of addresses or identity evidence. Um, how, how do we capture them? And you know, how, well, how does ad hoc gonna get to them? What are the plans? How do you capture some of their thoughts in your research? And So I think there are multiple angles here. We found, so we found certain communities where there's, um, where fewer people have been able to get them. And we also found a trend where um, a lot of people who don't have it yet are in very remote, small villages. So at this point, we understand that the UIDAI, the Unique Identity Authority of India, who's responsible for um, ATAR enrollment, is working to reach people. So they're, they're, they've been saying that they'll work with NGOs to reach the marginalized communities, that they'll um, consider ramping up uh, their mobile program where they can have mobile enrollment centers. Um, so we're, we're hoping that that will bear fruit. Mm -hmm. And then, and, um, yeah, there is an introducer system. The rules around that change every now and again. At first it was in the interest of expanding access, then there were worries about fraud, so that the rules around that are a little um, fluid. And um, Hawaii also asked, is there a fee 
or at all? For no, getting it is free, updating it does require a fee. And I guess that's one of the challenges, you know, is finding A, getting it updated seems to be a challenge and B, obviously cost, the cost of it as well is a challenge for people. And in fact, that was one of the questions is, you know, with, with people, um, sorry, I've just lost my question now. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, we, the other question that goes with that is, you know, there are a lot of teething difficulties that are being experienced by, um, by ADHA. Updating, I'm guessing, is one of those things. So, you know, like with so many, I mean, if you're talking about millions, actually the error rate is not that bad when you, when you look at it. But, uh, but you know, the, the, there are obviously some challenges about getting to everybody. It's, you know, it's uh, updating it. It's, it's function smoothing. Is, is this typical? Is this, you know, if, would we expect this from any ID system? Um, or, you know, are India doing particularly badly or, or particularly well in comparison to some of the others? Do you have a feel for that? Um, I think we intentionally didn't go that route because our intention was not to say this is good or bad. It was just to say, here's what's happening on the ground because a lot of the debates around ATAR were happening in a data poor environment. So we actually never did go and compare the, the error rates to other countries or anything like that. But I'd, I'd love to hear from people on the call who know um, how they feel the error rate is, is doing. Great. Um, the other thing that Sonia has brought up, which I think is another interesting question, is uh, data security concerns. Um, mm -hmm. that they, people have read about data security concerns and breaches. And are they happening? And, and are, are the Indian people concerned? Is this, is this a concern that they raised in their research with you? Preeti, do you want to take this one? This is your expertise. <laughs> Hard, hardly, hardly. I can, I can attempt. Uh, again, I think it's really difficult to paint a very accurate picture. I think from our sort of uh, study, I think uh, there wasn't <laughs> sort of a massive experience or, uh, you know, sort of perception. People mostly, A, trust the government a lot. Uh, just any sort of service from the government is highly trusted. And I think, I think more of it is a matter of perception as well. And, you know, of course, for our, from our conversations with UIDA as well, uh, you know, the system really only just authenticates. Now, there might be frauds that are routine uh, in, in actual services, whether that be a financial service or any other service, which is actually slightly outside the purview of Aadhaar itself, because the job of Aadhaar is literally to verify who you are as a person uh, and not really sort of, you know, can't be liable for service providers, uh, you know, whether they be government services or private services. So, so I think that's, it's, it's a bit of a, not an easy sort of question to answer, but, you know, of course, uh, from their perspective, the system is very robust and really sort of difficult. But having said that, I'm sure sort of, you know, but there are people who can potentially sort of use some of these data and then a lot of people sort of actually are not aware of again where to give data where it's mandatory and so on right so I'm not sure if that answers the question but uh you know i think it, it is sort of yeah not 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 a straightforward thing to be able to answer but i think the perception especially among civil society folks is very much you know one of concern uh, but on the ground, we found, you know, it's sort of at least functioning as an ID system that it's, it's meant to. And I, I think I want to add something else. And I think it's that perception is that, I mean, you, you know, we managed to get to such a crucial number of people who've got at her because of the trust you know, that they have in, in that, you know, that would not exist that, you know, if the trust didn't exist, there wouldn't have been such a huge sign up but Randa has asked an interesting question um so yes you know it was it was mandatory then it wasn't now it's voluntary but why do 72 percent of people do you think you know what did you come across why do people still think that um, it is mandatory is it, is it because of the fact that they're continually asked for it all the time to access services it's probably a combination of things 
So it was mandatory at one point. That Supreme Court judgment was passed at the end of 2018, and we did our research mid-2019. It takes time for these things to be implemented and to, to percolate down um, across the whole country. But I do think that people were just asked for ATAR everywhere, and they just assumed it was mandatory. Or if, and we know that some people have actually been told, no, 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 you have to give ATAR, even when it um, wasn't necessarily the case. Yeah, it's, it's almost like, I mean, I just had the exact conversation with my accountant today who, who asked me for uh, registering a digital signature of mine to be able to pay taxes that he needs my other, not just the number, but actually a scanned copy with my photograph on it. So I literally had a five minute long conversation asking if this was mandatory or is it just because he signed up for it or what is it? And so, and in fact, I mean, people like me would not have signed up for it if I did not have to pay my taxes because, you know, we don't need to use government benefits, you know, in that sense. So, so it is really hard because when a service provider sort of asks for it, many people don't even think twice, you know, they, it's, it's a form of convenience, you know, that you just hand over this one sort of ID and you get the service. Uh, so it's partly both, I think, misinformation on both sides, you know, of uh, people not being aware of what, when it's mandatory or not, and then service providers equally sort of finding it very convenient. And I, I think somebody also asked the question of uh, cost effectiveness of providing services and so on. So it is a very, very cost effective way to authenticate a person. And but if you had to do it manually to give people bank accounts, et cetera, it would cost way more. So, you know, from that perspective as well, a lot of people tend to ask for it because it's easy. And Randa's asked um, another question, which is what happens if the card gets lost or stolen? What's the process for reissuance of the card? So I can speak from personal experience. I managed to lose mine and I had not written down the number, which was a crucial mistake. If you know your number, you simply get it reissued because it's the number that is the identification. It's not the printed card itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you need to get it reissued without knowing the number, you can go and give your biometrics again um, and your demographic details and it'll run a sort of a matching algorithm in the background and figure it out for you. That can get very, very complicated um, as I experienced, but in, in a normal case, if you know your number, it just, it's just a reissuance. Um, and we have a question from Ibrahim asking, um, is the data or the identity life cycle, your birth, death, or you know, immigration, is it managed um, by, you know, connected with ADHAR? Um, are they a sort of, they connected together or do you, are they not? How does that sort of work as a legal instrument? No, no. So um, ADHAR basically, the system does not register your death as far as I know, your, your number just lives on. Um, children are not necessarily captured at birth. I mean, you, it, registration is voluntary, so you can get registered uh, right at birth or you can, can get registered long after. For small children, I think their ATAR is actually linked to their parents' ATAR because the biometrics are not collected. Mm -hmm. um, and migration shouldn't actually affected. Originally it was only for residents, so if you were an Indian national abroad you weren't supposed to get it, um, but that was recently changed so that if you're an Indian national uh, you can even get it if you're abroad. Mm. Or if you live abroad, you, I don't think you can get it abroad yet, you can only get it in India. In India. Okay. Um, and Edit ask an interesting question which I think relates to what you said. So as children, um, I'm guessing like doing your biometrics is a bit of a challenge, you know, as you grow and obviously in, and also potentially how does biometrics work with, with, a, with maybe the disability or dis, you know, disformity, you're not having you know, the ability to have fingerprints, etc. Is that, how does ADHAR deal with those kind of things? Mm -hmm. um, so there's an exception handling mechanism for people with disabilities. Um, that's covered if you've lost a digit or a limb. Um, 
young children's biometrics are not captured, but where you run into, tr into troubles particularly is with, for the elderly, or f even for people who are not elderly but do manual labor, fingerprints erode. And, um, you know, for, for people who where it just erodes because of labor, they will grow back. And we've heard of people actually skipping a day or two of work before they um, need to authenticate because otherwise it won't work. But for the elderly, it's very, very difficult. Um, and they, they, do, um, they do run into troubles with that. And I think the, that's one more reason why exception handling mechanisms really need um, a close eye and a lot of attention so that you can manage these problems. And Jessica, um, asking a question here about DigiLocker. Um, so did you find this is used um, widely or not at all um, in your research? So we didn't specifically ask for DigiLocker, but we asked for some of the other mobile phone based um, applications and um, their adoption was fairly low at this point. Again, connected to the, the same issues that you were saying, lack of uh, access to a mobile phone for some and also the connection of the ADHA number. Link. Number two, number. Yeah. Okay, so both of those things are, and and do you know like is there a program, an ongoing program to try and increase the accuracy of the adha with the mobile number? Um, do you know of anything, Preeti? I I haven't followed that particular issue. Yeah, that that is one of the trickiest challenges uh, with the mobile thing. And so that's the other thing, right? Errors are not necessarily just errors, but they're like life changes that you need. You've moved places or you've had a child or, you know, you've got to change your mobile number and that needs to be updated. In fact, I recently updated my address. It was absolutely painless uh, and actually free. So I think maybe depending on the update there is, uh, you know, this, the, and which form of update you do, it's, uh, it's, it varies. But no, I'm not really aware of uh, the mobile number sort of uh, mm -hmm. linkage and process. It's, it's tricky because you can update some things online if your mobile number is linked, but you cannot update your mobile number online because um, that's, what, that what, that's what's required to do the online update. So um, I'm not aware of anything on that front. So that one error can really make almost everything very, very difficult to change. Hmm. But interestingly, though, you still said that most people, even if those who had had errors with and, and um, challenges updated, still found benefits from and, and were still quite positive about ATAR, though. Yes, on balance, most people were quite positive about it. And maybe Preeti, you can um, speak a little bit to the the, the in-depth interviews, the HCD um, findings that we had. Yeah, I mean, I, I think when it worked, it was magical, right? So I think uh, in terms of being able to get you access. Uh, but, you know, again, sort of, and, and for, especially for people who didn't even have any form of identity before, that's really a massive change, you know, like I think Petra mentioned about transgender people or, you know, increasingly with children and so on. I think it's, it's great to be able to have that. Um, but, but yeah, I think overall sort of, uh, it, it, is, it is something that has, it was meant to simplify and again, sort of from the government perspective, really ensure that the benefit goes to the intended beneficiaries. And really sort of it was a system to actually eff efficiently and effectively transfer benefits to the right eligible people. And that's kind of was actually one of the foundations of it other than to give people an identity and so on. Uh, so from that perspective, yes, when it works, it's magical. When it does not work, which is really sort of, again, uh, not necessarily a failure of Aadhaar, but, you know, the failure of the service provider, infrastructure failure, like, you know, phone not working, electricity not being there, and a whole, like, fingerprints are eroded. I mean, these are sort of common situations in villages in India, for example. So it's, it's, it can be very frustrating, but I believe that in some cases there are also overriders for some of these things. And so, 
you know, while sort of Aadhaar has become this one identity system, people do have, you know, a whole bunch of other cards, identities for various things, you know, to indicate that they're, you know, sort of below poverty line and should be given free rations and so on. So uh, there are also overriders if technology fails. Um, so yeah, I think that's sort of more of more of the experience. But people overall, I think, uh, felt that was a great step that was taken to, to give them identities. And we've got a question that's coming sort of from Chris and Ibrahim, which are, which are kind of similar, talking about some of the, I guess, some of the legalities. So we've got, we've got um, a, a human rights group coming to talk to us on our webinar next month about the impact or potential impact of um, Huduma Namba in Kenya. Um, and we also know, I've read articles, um, rightly or wrongly, and I'm not making a judgment, I'm just going to share what some of those articles were saying around how China have used some of their, um, their digital identity systems to put, put purposefully exclude proportions of the, um, of the population. Now, what I'm hearing in, from you, and do correct me if I'm wrong, but that's kind of not what's happening. People are unfortunately being excluded by being in rural areas, or I'm guessing through lack of like homeless from lack of having proof of address or proof of, you know, sort of, sort of living somewhere, but people are not being particularly targeted with India or is or is that is that is it a concern is it something that we need to be sort of thinking about in terms of in completely from an inclusion perspective so I think our sense was that there wasn't any um, systematic targeting we did find um, instances of discrimination for example that you know, because of prejudices, their gender people weren't allowed into the enrollment office and so on. But it did not look, it looked like, um, you know, lo local discrimination of people taking calls they weren't supposed to. It did not look like systematic discrimination to us. We also, you know, we did various demographic analyses and the, the takeaway from them was basically people who are generally disadvantaged are disadvantaged here as well, but not that there was a, a targeted um, intervention in that sense. I think that the potential danger is a different one. It's if everything is linked to um, can can you then start profiling? And the Atar system itself does not collect any information about your caste or your religion or anything that's not in, in those uh, demographic and biometric fields that, um, that are listed. And it is designed to do nothing but say, yes, based on the information you've sent me, this person is who they say it is. The issue comes is if people have access to multiple databases and everything in those databases is linked to ATAR, and then they start backlinking those. And the Supreme Court, is my understanding, has sort of tried to shut that down, but I think it's a, it's a key worry of civil society organizations that that, that can continue to happen. Yeah, I guess that's something we need to keep an eye on um, as, you know, just to, to, to make sure that people are protected, are feel safe and are trusted and not just their perception, but that's actually the reality of what's happening um, as well. But yeah, okay, thank you. That's good to know that there's not that. Yeah, we know people are excluded, but it's not done in a particular, you know, as you say, like a systemic way. Um, we have another question from Ibrahim who um, says, you know, he likes the transparency that, um, that Adhar has, has built. Um, can you shed more light into the um, interoperability of how the data is collected and used? And I guess that's how everything, how do all the different players that can use Adhar, um, how, are they, how are they allowed to do that? And how are they only allowed to access certain amounts of information, as you said? Mm -hmm. um. So I'm not an expert on the technology and Preeti, feel free to jump <laughs> in here. Um, basically anyone who's allowed to use it for um, biometric authentication 
is allowed to access the system and get a yes no answer this is the person i think it's been expanded that it's the system is allowed to push back other information in very specific circumstances but i don't know the details of that um and there are supposed to be very solid walls between say the database of ration card holders and the Atar database. Um, in that sense, I wouldn't necessarily talk about interoperability. The one place where you might speak of interoperability is where Atar is used as a financial address and building on Atar, you then have um, an entire additional stack that gets into um, financial products. But, uh, for the others, they're, they're supposed to be quite separate. And it's just, um, you know, you, even in that sense for the financial products, it's just a way of proving that you say who you are, who you say you are. And then it's the service provider's responsibility to figure out everything else that they need to know. Like, are you eligible for this service or not? Um, yeah, I think I think Petra is right. I mean, I, I greatly doubt that uh, if your other is linked to your bank account, your taxes and so on, there is some kind of a talking between the systems. Uh, you know, there isn't because then, of course, it becomes a really powerful database. And, and, and that's not, you know, ethically or morally in many other ways. Right. But, you know, the at least the sort of claims from the UID itself is really one that all it is, is, as Petra said, is to verify whether you are the person you say you are. And it does not accumulate, you know, sort of a database on your specific digital ID number of all the things that, you know, uh, it, it, you, you are actually linking it to. That, that, is, that is the claim. Uh, and, you know, sort of, but yeah, we, we don't know anything beyond that. And that, that is kind of really our, yeah, experience of it so far. And I think a lot of our current students who are on um, one of our courses called um, Legion Digital Money Markets and so those historically who've been on it were learning about the India stack and that interoperability of how, you know, that number allows you to pay, you know, anyone. It does, it's sort of often when you're doing financial transactions, you know, peer to peer, um, it, it can be quite difficult because, you know, you might have a, um, your mobile wallet might be with one provider and the person you want to send is with another provider and, you can't send, so you end up having to have multiple e-wallets with different mobile money providers to, to send that, that, that money, but at least um, through the use of the, the Adhan number, that actually takes some of those challenges and difficulties financially and to make those small peer-to-peer -peer financial transactions much easier. Great. And so our last question, which I think is a good one to, uh, to end on today, is from um, Josef. And, you know, what is the what is it the resilience like? I mean, do, does um, do we have times when the system goes down, or you go to you know try and biometrically authenticate yourself, and the system's offline? Um, is that some of the challenges that are also experienced by people as well? Yeah, I think definitely. Um, you know, one of the points of authentication is in a ration shop where you go to get your food ration, and if the mobile signal is weak that day or the power is out then you can't authenticate and um, that leads to delays or people going to the shop multiple times instead of just once um, in that sense it could it could use a little more um, technological resilience also now during corona um, during the crisis the um, the centers were closed for a very long time. Um, I was actually just trying to figure out for a friend a few days ago whether they're they're actually opening again or not, and I'm I'm not sure. Um, so there are definitely points of resilience that can can be built in. Part of that goes to the exception handling that I was talking to about earlier. So if you can't authenticate biometrically, what what else can you do, and what are the rules for it? Um, but it goes goes beyond that even. And just one last question from, from me, um, just to sort of summarize and sort of point things together, you know, what were, your, what were you surprised about maybe, or what were you happy to, to find during your research? It'd be love to just sort of get 
from, from both of you, sort of just a little, you know, the key highlights, your own personal key highlights. I, I, I can go. I, I think definitely one of the big surprises was even the people who were denied services were incredibly satisfied with our time. And that was really sort of mind boggling for us. And uh, I think somewhere down the line, we also realized that, uh, you know, how we were defining a denial of a service was very different to how the person was thinking about it, you know, because uh, it was like, okay, I got it at the end of two years. So it's not a denial. And it took me multiple attempts, but I got it in the end. <laughs> so, so that was just really interesting, you know, which also points to kind of limitations of methodologies, you know, when you're doing these kind of things is definitional challenges and so on. But the fact that overall, you know, I mean, it, it really, and I think our own ingoing positions or hypothesis was very much around like, no, this could be a tool for a sort of, you know, data privacy issues and all of that. But I think when you look at the ordinary residents kind of experience of uh, using this ID, it really sort of gives you perspective on what it's done for them. Uh, you know, despite, of course, getting an ID for 1.2 billion people is no small feat at all. So, you know, I think a 2% error rate or, you know, whatever it is, even though it runs in millions, is, uh, is, is yeah, and especially for a country like India where infrastructure is just still very, very getting updated. So that, I think, for me, definitely was one of the biggest surprises. Thank you, Priti. And Petra? And um, yeah, I think we were we were pretty much all surprised along along the same lines. But one of the things that I really took away from it is that if you looked at the very marginalized communities, um, how valuable this could be for them, right? It was it was designed to be for everyone, no matter your background, no matter your circumstance, right? So I think what we saw is that for people who really struggled to have an ID to get access to services before, it was incredibly valuable. And that just sort of reinforces the need for a push to get it to all of them. Um, you know, that everyone who wants it can get it, um, especially homeless families, their gender communities, very, very remote rural populations, because it can be so much more valuable for them than it is, as Preeti suggested, um, herself or me. Yeah. Great. And I mean, thank you both so much for spending time and sharing the findings and, and your own personal insights as well. Um, although we know there are some challenges which can feel a little disheartening. Actually, Preeti, you said when you're talking about, you know, 1.2 billion um, you know, you, you just can see how well India actually has done, um, how well, the, you know, this idea has penetrated. And, that, and as you, you know, you said, Petra, you know, how it's already brought significant benefits to people who perhaps were previously excluded before. And the hope is that, you know, this, this further push to, to, I guess, A, make sure, you know, more, get, get those last few people on, on board and getting a number, but also to, to iron out some of those issues with updating. Um, when those happen, then the, you know, the, the ability and inclusivity of, of India's system is actually very admirable. Well, I really appreciate your time this afternoon and also to all the attendees that joined us today as well. I've, I've enjoyed reflecting and, and learning a little bit more about you know, the, the impact and some of the challenges, but also Know, massively the successes and I really enjoyed also seeing that from a user perspective. I know sometimes we look at these programs from the government perspective and what benefits they've brought but it's so actually so much more interesting um, to look at it from the user perspective and, and get an idea of how it's impacting you know many people's lives. So thank you so much um, and just a quick heads up for everybody we've also got another webinar coming up as I was saying on Haduma Nama in Kenya and we're also running Digital Identity Week, um, which is a new thing that we're trialing here with DFI in November, um, where we're discussing some of the challenges and issues that are, that are currently happening um, around digital identity. So look out for those. Um, we'll be sending you more information about those. And, and Petra and Priti, I hope you can join us on some of those live discussions that we're going to be having as well. That would be great to have you. Um, so thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you all again at another webinar soon. Thanks everybody. Thank Bye.